as we move into these times of discontinuities and interacting stresses, which are so hard to predict, maybe we just have to take more risks and be much, much more loving and see where it gets us. Hi, Vicki Robin here, host of What Could Possibly Go Right, a project of the Post Carbon Institute, in which we interview cultural scouts, people who see far and serve the common good, asking each one our one big question. In the midst of all that seems to be going wrong or going awry, what could possibly go right? And my guest today is Peter Lipman, and he is the former and founding chair of Transition Network and Common Cause Foundation, and also chaired the UK government's Department of Energy and Climate Change's Community Energy Contact Group. He's been a teacher, a cooperative worker, an intellectual property lawyer, and worked at the UK uh, charity SusTrans, latterly as external affairs director before setting up Anthropocene Actions, a community interest company that promotes fair, loving, and ecologically regenerative societies. And now here's Peter. Okay, welcome Peter Lipman to What Could Possibly Go Right. And you and I met through Transition Towns, and we have historically both worked on cultural change. You know, we've used social processes like open space and World Cafe and Conversation Cafe. We believed in working together in human relations and shared values. I mean, we believed in culture. We, <laughs> we believed in a change of heart and mind can lead to changes how, in how we collectively live on this earth. We, we believed that cool initiatives like transition towns or for me, like the conversation cafes or your money, your life could spread like wildfire and turn the tide. And, and I think for me, and I think for both of us, this has been like an article of faith. Yet in each of our countries from the response to COVID to Brexit, there's been some uninvited guests who are actually aren't people and they don't actually play by the rules of mutual respect, by which I mean deliberate disinformation and social media manipulation by who knows who, just to name a few. And then along comes QAnon in the United States, and then the pandemic, and then the sovereignty movements, call them anti-vax or anti-mask or anti-government. And I, I soon saw that if we couldn't do this, if we couldn't collectively meet the threat of the pandemic, how are we going to move our civilization away from fossil fuels and the general drift of assault on Mother Earth? And yet, I think it's also an article of faith for both of us that in every breakdown are seeds of breakthrough, which is the premise of this podcast, uh, asking people like you who think long-term and systemically where you see possibilities emerging. So this is gonna be over to you, Peter, in the midst of all that seems to be going awry, what could possibly go right? Oh, thank you for that intro. Um, yeah, I mean, everything that you just said really resonates for me. Uh, I've, been, I've been watching, particularly watching the kind of dominant, powerful world's response to the, the pandemic with, um, unfortunately, not with surprise, but with, with a kind of real bashing to my, my faith, which is a faith that human beings, all of us, have an extraordinary capacity for empathy, for connection, for love, for sharing. Of course, we have other capacities. We have capacities for aggressiveness and defensiveness and, and all of those other things. But, but so much of my work has been based, as you were saying, on, 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 on how do we engender cultural changes towards the former and away from the latter. And watching the responses to the pandemic, the idea that uh, Pfizer and Moderna and others' profits come first and human lives come second, um, that, that, was, that was really upsetting, it is still, obviously really upsetting watching some of the responses to to the health care workers um, here in the UK being abused equally upsetting um, 
And as you say, in, in all of these things, there are always seeds of hope. And, and, and one of the seeds of hope for me was seeing for the first time, a, a really high level and, and well-argued case against private, private health healthcare, against uh, the use of intellectual property. And there's, there, there's a whole raft of expanding in what does intellectual property even mean, against the use of in intellectual property to enable profits for a few and to really mean the rationing of life for the many. And the many, of course, is always going to be those with less access to money. So the poor world. And then you get straight into the questions about how that came about, that the world was, was set up in that way where, you know, pre-colonial conquest, India had, had a massive uh, GNP, uh, was a really rich country. And, 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 and look at how it was left after the East India Company and, and, and British imperialism. So, and you see it playing out again and again. So yeah, it, it, it's been a tough time. And I say that from a position of absolute privilege in comparison to most people, you know, sitting here in my, in my home office, able to work remotely with an income. It's been a really tough time for a lot of people and it hasn't augured well for the much, much, more desperate and, and deep-seated issues around climate breakdown, around gross inequality, around loss of biodiversity, around the multiple stresses that, that we're facing. Uh, and just this week, we got told that we're pretty certainly past yet another planetary boundary having, having with, with plastics and chemicals. So that kind of takes me back to, to what motivates me. And, and, I, and I, I suppose what motivates me is that comes back to really what, what, what gives me in my own life meaning. And, and, and that is to try to do something about these things. Um, no matter what, what it looks like. I, I partly inherited that from my parents who were both white anti-apartheid activists in apartheid South Africa and took massive risks. And I partly inherited it from um, just a kind of, well, what else are you going to do in this world? Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you talked about all these, all these challenges we face, but if, if we don't do anything, then we're, we're guaranteed that things will get worse and it'll happen very fast. So we might as well have a go. And certainly cultural change uh, feels to me to be an enormously important part of that having a go, that holding out that belief that we can do better and, and trying experiments and maybe trying experiments that aren't based on a careful iteration of, of what we know, an extrapolation from certainty, but taking more risks, um, whether that's in how inclusive we are or uh, how much we, try things in a deeply emergent way where we really aren't even trying to control the outcomes. Um, it, it seems as if as part of moving out of the Holocene into, you can call it the Anthropocene, you can call it the Capitalocene. Uh, some people now call it the Pyrocene because of all the fires. Um, as we move into these times of discontinuities and interacting stresses, which are so hard to predict, maybe we just have to take more risks and be much, much more loving and see where it, where it gets us. Did you say take more risks and be more loving? Yeah, Well, I awesome. What is social love in the time of breakdown? That is so interesting. I, I, I just want to link, link it to something else that occurred to me while you're saying, talking is that another article of faith is in localization, you know, where people mm -hmm. can actually it's not the right way to say it, but you know, where your reputation matters, you know, your reputation is a currency. Being a good actor in a local community makes a difference in how much that community will, will show up for you in any way, shape mm. or form. And, and it gives you, you know, local power it has nothing to do really with money. It has to do with relationship. You know, we've both worked on localization and in, there's something in that localization that's loving you know mm. it's if you're going to be loving it's where it shows up 
right? Yeah. yeah totally. So, I mean, there's a lot in what you're saying that's, that's so um, provocative. We're deeply social beings and we really are shaped by what's around us. If we're shaped, if the culture around us is one of fear of anger, that, that's really hard to kind of cut yourself off from. You know, it, it'll seep into us because of the way we are. If the culture around us is one of empathy and connection, again, that will massively influence us with always individual variation. So how, how do we change those cultures? And, and as you say, the, 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 the culture at a big abstract level matters, but the, the culture of the people around us, the, the people that we, we see regularly, the people that we work with or socialize with will we'll really shape what we think is possible. And at a time like this, where it's easy to feel deeply discouraged and maybe hopeless about climate breakdown, about all of those other factors, about the rise of authoritarian regimes, about massive inequality, about, for me in the UK, living in a country which until recently was part of a Europe which was arming its borders, which was leaving people to drown in the Mediterranean. Um, what are the seeds of, of, of action in that? And, and the seeds of action for me are always there as part of that kind of, that challenge. So, you know, when, when, when there are people in, in, in Greece, in other countries who are taking risks legally to, to support asylum seekers and refugees, uh, when there are ship's captains who are prepared to sail their ship into harbour in Italy, with a boat full of, of desperate refugees. Um, you know, we, we, we constantly have examples around us of people who, who can reach that inner love, that, that compassion, that, that feeling of connection to others and can act on it. And, and so unless I believe that everyone or nearly everyone has that capacity, but certainly most of us have that capacity, um, I, d I don't know where I'll find my kind of energy and my, 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 my motivation, but I do believe that. I, I know that although we get hurt and damaged and we end up repeating patterns that aren't useful or helpful, um, I, I know that we can also be inspired and, and particularly be inspired by the people around us. So, so it, it feels worth constantly experimenting. And, and I suppose when I look back at what I've done over the years, I've, I've always been fascinated by what, what enables communities to, to access that kind of group wisdom, but also to make better choices. And before transition, I, I worked at a, a sustainable transport NGO here in the UK called Sustrans. And, and my particular uh, passion there was, was how do we take this road between the houses, this highway space, and how do we redefine it? Because that's where we meet each other. We don't meet each other in our houses. We meet each other when we come out. And if we come out into a, a threatening, hostile environment, then we'll tend to be defensive. So how can we change the physical environment to make it a welcoming space for everyone and also then change the dynamics of how we behave? And, and it's those two things together. So you, it's not just about the culture for me. It's about what is the architecture, the, the, the infrastructure within that which that culture can thrive. And so an architecture, just going back to the roads, an architecture which says, this is a space for cars. It's a space for big metal boxes. It's not a space for kids to play. It's not a, a space for people to chat or sit. Well, what happens if we change that physical space and we actually say, we're gonna break up the sight lines. We're going to have a little playing area right by the road. We're going to have trees in the road so that you can't see a long way and go really fast. So that, that can change the physical infrastructure, but what do we do then around the culture? What events do we hold? What practices do we support and encourage? And in many ways, the whole transition movement is doing the same thing as that, but on multiple levels about multiple things. It's saying it's not just about the space between our houses. It's about all of those in massively important flows, money, food, energy. How do we as a community take control over those things, but do it in a way 
that respects limits and boundaries and other people's needs. And, and the we, I, I, every time I say the word we, I, I kind of stop and I think, who, what do I mean by that? Because right. of course the, the we has multiple levels. There's the we of your street, if you're doing that kind of work. There's the we of your town. There's the we of your country, maybe. There's the we of maybe beyond humanity, because so many times we draw the, 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 the boundaries of our circles of compassion, of empathy around the people like us. And the word people is an interesting one there. Do we mean just humans by that? You know, so you look at other cultures um, and so many cultures uh, kind of other, other beings beyond human beings uh, are, are part of that we. There's a deep relationship. They may be hunted. They may be at, but there's a relationship there, not a kind of atomized, disconnected. This is something that is a thing that I consume. So I'm kind of in my in my attempts to bring to, to experiment with all of this. I suppose I'm, I'm I'm trying to grapple with with culture at lots and lots of different levels. Another movement I'm involved in um, is uh, the name that sticks, even though it's not the name I love, is called FIRE, Financial Independence Retire Early. And I, I stumbled into it after years of having like, you know, just abandon your money or life because I wanted to do other things and discovered that there's like millions of people around the world who are in this process of trying to unhook, sort of like pole vault, you know, use cap use capitalism to pole vault over capitalism and, and reclaim their time. And, um, and, and yet to what end, you know, <laughs> that's the question. Mm -hmm. And so I have sort of discovered this deep bench of, of people in this movement who are really concerned about capitalism and private property. They're really concerned about, they, 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 they I can just feel them like, Ugh, pushing out the boundaries of this capitalist system. How do we, how do we, how do we exist in this? And I'm, I'm trying to communicate like, well, maybe we have a responsibility. Maybe we're a bunch of people who have actually decoded money to a certain degree, and maybe we can actually take stands and, and intervene. So um, I'm calling it financial independence, regenerate everything, you know, that's what I recast it as. But what I notice there and so many places is that, well, in that group, there's clearly an interest in local action. There's clearly an interest in like, I'm not going to work for money, but what am I going to work for? What enterprise can I start? You know, what, where can I act in the community? We're talking about local investing and investing in businesses in your community. And, um, and so I just, I, I'm feeling intimately because I'm working on this, the intense desire to know what to do. This, this sense that we don't have agency in a world that is sort of crashing in upon us. And this need for, agency and not agency as you know I can see that agency can become violent because you just you just need to push this out of your space and and, and yet you know when you try to go like okay fine like what's the 10 things you can do you don't end up with a kind of list that really reflects what you're saying you know what is the list of interventions you know, at the scale of intimacy and also at the scale of, you know, like just being a little rudder on a big ship, you know, just being like a little, like they, we used to talk mm. about trim tabs. And I'm hearing a clue, a couple of clues of what you're saying. One is loving. One is the architecture. Like how, how can we intervene in our community so that you put a table out on the sidewalk. Like I live in a cul-de-sac, you know, I could put a table out in the middle of the cul-de-sac and, you know, the fire truck just has to get around it <laughs> and, and, you know, have a conversation out there. What are the ways that we, what are the creative risky ways that we can interrupt 
the patterns of atomization, as you say. Um, you also talked about property and intellectual property, but property itself, the boundaries of our homes, you know, like stay out the front door. How can we, how do we risk interrupting the boundaries and, in a in this sort of almost like playful loving way so mm. um and the other thing you said was like they were treating everything like things uh, including people you know they're just numbers mm. they're just you know so how do we like how do we well you know heartful people in the midst of even this massive you know, sort of tidal pull in, in the other direction. How do we stand in that undertow and be congruent with our values and actually do things? Yeah. So there's a there's a big setup for you. <laughs> well, it's interesting. You're you're connecting taking risks with acting for others, with others. And I suppose, and, and then you brought in property. Uh, I'm I'm not convinced. And you mentioned capitalism at the start of it all. I'm not convinced that actually we can really feel safe or loved or looked after in a capitalist world. The, the, you know, the, the, the basic, one of the basic threads of capitalism is scarcity, is that mm. everything is rationed by access to money. And so we, we, it's normal, quotes, normal, for us in the societies that you and I live in to walk past homeless people. What an extraordinary idea. Here we are in countries where there are almost always more empty homes than there are homeless people. And yet it's normal to do that. How can you and I feel safe when we know that if something goes really wrong, we could be one of those homeless people? So I, I, I guess I'd start from saying, and this is where it gets risky, because we're living in that capitalist world where if things go wrong, you suffer. We have to find ways to make everyone feel safe. And one of the ways of doing that is very much at a local level, at a kind of, who, if, if, you know, if someone is struggling, we'll reach out, we'll help them. But, but that can be exclusive as well. We can, we can end up saying, as you could argue very strongly, that the European Union has said to people, poor people from the east, from the south of Europe, you can't come in. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll have you in as cheap labor, but with, uh, when we don't want you, then we just will we'll put up violent borders, we'll exclude people. So, so there has to be a challenge to us at a, at, a, at, a, at a higher level than just the local. So what do we do? What, what, what would it be mean? How would it be a meaningful program to end all homelessness anywhere in the world? as a part of enabling us to feel safe enough to take the risks that we need to, given inequality, climate breakdown, loss of biodiversity, all of those things. So then when I'm looking at, at, at a kind of, for example, you know, we were both involved, very involved in the transition movement. Uh, what, what, what could tra the transition movement do now to say, okay, we're setting up a community-owned renewable scheme, but we're not only going to say that people who have disposable money, wealth, can invest in it. We're going to say that there's some other mechanism where an ever-increasing proportion of the shares are held communally, not individually, where we go beyond a kind of small community benefit pot. So, uh, unless we do things that undermine that logic of capitalism, I think we will go on having wonderful dreams about a loving world and being pushed backwards steadily. And in fact, steadily and at an increasingly rapid rate from my perspective. So, so that's where the risk taking comes in. It actually, the real risk is to go against the dominant logic that operates all around us. And there are lots of ways of doing that. So, you know, Abolish, abolish intellectual property. And I speak as a former intellectual property lawyer. Abolish it, get rid of it. Uh, I don't think we need it. I think people are extraordinarily creative, particularly when we find something we're passionate, passionate about. We don't need patents for that. We need to unleash people's passion and energy and creativity, make people 
feel safe that you know universal basic assets for example uh which means that everyone has somewhere to live has access to the the, the income they need for food reparations how much of our current behavior stems from guilt from worry that there are past harms that that we some of us the, the you's and me's in that we are living off so you know what what are we going to have a meaningful reparations movement just look i mentioned india earlier you know what what, what about the relationship between the uk and india where on some uh, calculations the, the 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 uk took 66 trillion pounds from india as part of colonialism 66 trillion that's that's the infrastructure a lot of the infrastructure here in the uk do, do we just sit on that and ignore it but if we go back into history how far back do you go you know all of this needs a really kind of meaningful conversation and exploration and in order to have that we have to both be brave enough to expose ourselves to things not being exactly as they are at the moment which isn't such a bad thing when you look at how things are but then you get the, the the ticking clock of climate breakdown, the ticking clock of the emissions going up and up and out and out. And, and, and so it's like, how do we make change happen really fast? So that's the question. And that's partly why I'm so fascinated in cultural change, because in fact, because we are such social beings, such kind of plastic shapeable beings in our assumptions as to what's normal, what's feasible, what could happen, that feels to me like the key rather than a kind of a techno fix here or a kind of tinkering with the rules there you know and and, and look at some of the changes in in people's assumptions about what's normal that, that happen over decades can they happen faster so one of the things that uh, i'm doing with some colleagues at, at, at a small community interest company called anthropocene actions that we set up is to 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 look at the idea of solidarity and mm -hmm. say we've got this superpower we've got this ability to collaborate and there are so many of us who, who want to do something about what's going on in the world how could could there be a kind of an infrastructure for solidarity across geographies across differences where we support each other i i i, I watched a wonderful film called pride which is based on a true story from the 80s from the the the, the mining dispute here in the 80s where a group of lesbian and gay activists in london decided to support a group of miners and they they, right. they kind of picked picked an area on a map and decided they'd support a group of miners in the south wales valleys and of course at the beginning these were very very different cultures didn't really know how to communicate with each other but they got to know each other and partially as a result of what the activists from london had done the national union of mine workers changed its position on gay equality and gay marriage and used that vote that it had inside the Labour Party to, to lead to a change in Labour Party policy, which meant that eventually we got gay equality around marriage here in this country. Now, that was a fantastic example of non-transactional solidarity. The activists in London didn't reach out because they thought any of that was going to happen. But it happened. And that's, that's a fantastic example of what can emerge from loving non-transactional solidarity so I, I was watching the the water defenders the reports of the water defenders in north dakota and 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 both feeling massively heartened by the range of people coming to support the local defenders and also the lack of that infrastructure where you know who knows what would have happened if the defenders had reached out to the workers in the factories making the pipeline mm. but but the infrastructure for that doesn't exist. So we set up Solidarity Matters as a kind of experiment. Can you start to create and, and over time co-create a kind of dispersed viral infrastructure to enable solidarity across silos, across geographies? And that's a kind of an ongoing experiment for us that we've been working with. And it's in, it's in approaches like that, uh, that that it feels like we've got maybe a massive untapped potential yeah you bring to mind a couple of things number one um when i was in brazil when i started going to brazil they have the movimento um uh, same you know the, mm -hmm. the you know the landless peasants movement um where they interrupted 
the assumption of private property mm -hmm. and the assumption that you have the right to grow GMO corn or whatever. Um, and, and that actually gained momentum. You know, I mean, uh, Lula came out of that, you know, and there was a period of time where, uh, you know, they had um, Fomesero, you know, zero hunger, you know, it was like, mm. it was, you know, uh, a bolsa familia, you know, the, 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 basically everybody had a living wage, you know, small, but, um, and of course, then, you know, the forces, came, you know, I mean, we see the, mm. the pendulum swing, but that was a solidarity movement or the Via mm. Campesina, you know, this like, that is a powerhouse and, I wonder about other infrastructures for solidarity like that, where it's not just local. Like here in my community, there is a group of people, you know, BIPOC and white people who started a fund, a reparations, local reparations fund. And, and I was like, I'm all in, you know? So I, I, I gave money and, and the whole idea was that people, you know, whoever gets the money, you're not gonna determine that. You know, they're just people who need, and then there's a pot, you know, you're mm. putting money in the pot and they're not going to write you thank you notes. <laughs> mm. It's, it's, you know, and, and the, it just worked with my mind on that, you know, like, really, I, you know, and so I think, I think all small experiments in this are worthwhile. Another th thing we have, and I don't know if you have it is, um, we have these buy nothing groups It started near me on Bainbridge Island. And so now they're all over and it was po especially popular in the pandemic because you couldn't take your stuff to the thrift store, you know? And so the community weaving that has happened, and I'm sure we're not asking each other our politics, you know, and mm -hmm. we're just giving and receiving and giving and receiving. And it's just, it's a web now and it's a habit. And I'm just, I'm thinking in terms of the people who are asking, you know, whose consciousness has been raised and they're asking, you know, given the enormity of what's going on, what can I do? And this is a clue in this idea of mutual aid. Yeah, There's yeah. A clue in the buy nothing groups. It's a clue in babysitting cooperatives. There's a clue. There's all these places where people are figuring out to break the boundaries of the atomized world and stitch a cooperative world. T totally. And, and as you say, the pandemic enabled a, a flowering of mutual aid that was really beautiful um, and, and has left roots. And certainly in the, in the road I'm on where there, there wasn't a kind of community feeling like that. Now there's, there, there's a very regular community encounter and also people got tired and people get battered by the kind of the bigger forces, the city level forces or the national level forces. So the, the, the question to me is always, how do we operate on these different levels or scales simultaneously? So at the moment, the kind of maybe the, the thing that is, is most possibly going right in the whole world for me is, is Chile, where you have this extraordinary yes. thing going on where, you know, you, you had the, the, the devastating years of, of neoliberal brutality and, and austerity and then you then you have you know the the people's assemblies and the the raise in the the underground prices uh kind of coming together to spark a real national and local refusal to continue with with a kind of an unjust system you have then uh, you know a referendum can we just rip up the old constitution and have a new one yes you have elections for a, a um a grouping of 155 people to, to rewrite the constitution. And then you have a majority progressive left, indigenous feminist and environmentalists now setting out to, to write an, a democratically sourced ecological constitution. You have a, 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 a young new progressive president who's just named the first ever majority female cabinet in the whole of the Americas under, under representative democracy, you know. So, you, you, and all of that has happened in about two years, two or three years. So in terms of urgent change and, 
and, and the possibility of change, we know it's there. Now, that's not to say that everything will be easy in Chile. It'll all go swimmingly. You know, the, the forces of reaction are, no, are really not happy with Chile. And they're going to be even less happy if they think it's a good example that other countries are going to follow. But it's a, it's a reminder of the power of solidarity. People came together in the streets and they said, enough is enough. We're not going to put up with this anymore. So the question then again becomes, what is it that enables that? Now, in, in Chile, you know, it may be a particular culture, a particular set of circumstances. And, and, and I don't want to assume some kind of global you know, what works in one place works elsewhere. But, but I think the, the responsibility for people like you and me, people of relative privilege in this world, is to not sit back in our kind of comfort zone and kind of think, oh, well, they managed that in Chile, but, you know, that would never happen in the US or that would never happen here in the UK, is to say, well, okay, what can we do? What, you know, what can we do to connect up local movements, national movements, to learn from other countries, particularly for countries like the UK and the US, to really learn from the extraordinary movements around the world in the global south. So, yeah, I mean, the, the weaving together of all of those things comes back in a way to the, the kind of saying, how do we use our privilege in a way that, that, that you know, our time, our capacity, whatever, in a, in, a, in a way that is proportionate to what's going on in the world. And what's going on in the world is devastating. And, you know, it's not as if it's a new thing. For many peoples in the world, this has been going on for decades, if not centuries. Uh, so it's about acting now with urgency. And yet, somehow doing that from a place of calm and a place of not seeking to control outputs, outcomes, of kind of going with what emerges. Uh, so it's like, like so many of these things are kind of a, a massive paradox. Uh, but yeah, I mean, actually, as I've got older, I certainly haven't got wiser, but I've got more accepting of paradox. Exactly. It's like, as, as Bio says, uh, you know, the times are urgent, we must go slow. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think this is a beautiful cherry on top of our conversation. I think it's a beautiful place to, to leave it, you know, with a lot of examples and a lot of ambiguity so that people who watch this and are thinking, but what can I do? I mean, you've actually given a lot of ideas about how we participate in this world in such a way that, you know, not that we're going to have the outcome we want, but we're going to have the experience of solidarity that we long for. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Vicky. It's been lovely yeah. to chat. Hey, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review so that this hopeful message can get out to more people. Check out Post Carbon Institute's Resilience website for show notes and for more guest information. Thanks also to Asher Miller, Amy Burringrood, and Clara Winter of Post Carbon Institute, plus production assistant Michelle Wig from frugalityandfreedom.com.